No problem in our time is a fraction so important as that of the arms competition between the United States and the USSR. It deeply involves economic and political life. It could bring all life to an end in ours. In this program, I propose to take a cool look at this competition and not spend much time assessing blame. Both sides concentrate sufficiently on that now. My only assumption will be that all people, regardless of ideology, want to live. What is the nature of this terrible competition? What faith sustains it? Or what ideas? How have the ideas changed with the years? And what is the escape? We come naturally for an answer to the United States Air Force Academy, to this spacious and glittering campus, which is at the marvelously sharp line where the plain for the Great Plains end and the Rockies begin. The Air Force is the primary custodian of the American side of the competition, and its campus is the natural bridge between the ideas and the action. The sense of U.S.-Soviet competition proceeds, I believe, from one of two ideas. The older of these ideas we may call the official faith, and it's manifested here at the Academy. This faith holds that the competition is the result of an irreconcilable conflict between inherently hostile systems. Their communism, here capitalism, their authoritarian discipline, here liberty, their atheism, avowed materialism, here faith, spiritual values. Air Force Academy Chapel here at Colorado Springs is, in a way, a metaphor of this faith. The controversy that its highly engineered architecture has aroused, I find myself admiring it, suggests the dispute that this faith engenders. In this faith, no reconciliation is possible. Two economic and political systems are in enduring conflict. Those who believe in accommodation between the systems do not understand the depths of this difference. They are naive and thus open to the cupidity, the cheating of the other side. But there is a second, more recent view. The military forces in each country exist in a symbiotic relationship with those who develop and manufacture the arms. Each lives off the other, each contributes to the other's growth. And the United States is then locked into a symbiotic relationship with the Soviet Union, and vice versa. In this relationship, each country, by the weapons it invents and acquires, provides the need for the other power to do likewise and more. Each works with the other to ensure that the competition is self-perpetuating. No faith sustains this competition. It's a trap. Mankind is its victim. There are many ways that the history of the last 30 years might be written. I see it overwhelmingly as a movement from a conflict in faith to, a, to an acceptance of the trap. All of us in such matters are the products of our education. Mine began at the end of World War II in Berlin. I knew Berlin before World War II. For reasons that seemed impressive at the time, I came here in 1938 to study Hitler's land and agricultural policy. My next glimpse of the city was when the American forces moved in during the summer of 1945. One thought of the landscape of the moon, and it was a phrase that came to many lips. When eventually we saw the landscape of the moon, we learned that it was more austere, more chaste, and much less alarming. In pre-war times, this was the Hausvaterland, a famous conglomerate of restaurants and cabarets. Each of the different watering places featured the music and costume and food and alcohol of a different part of the Reich. In 1945, pretty much all of Berlin proper looked like this. Buildings are a metaphor of the suffering that goes with war. The experience of horror is by people, but that does not persist. Soon it cannot be seen, only in structures does it really endure? In Berlin, the horror of war endures here. Endures most widely in what was once a music hall. That horror is no small thing.
That summer, I was at a military headquarters near Frankfurt. We were studying the effects of the air attacks on Germany. One morning, one of my colleagues, George W. Ball, later under Secretary of State and much else, called to remind me that the Big Three would soon be meeting at Potsdam to decide the future of Germany. He was not a modest man, and he thought we should attend. I noted as a difficulty that we hadn't been invited. George said that to allow hurt feelings to keep us away would only compound that error. We flew to Berlin, went to the conference compound, and began operations with an excellent lunch of the senior officers' mess. My concern with reparations, economic policy, currency reform deepened, and in 1946 I became the State Department bureaucrat in charge of economic affairs in the occupied lands, principally Germany. A less powerful job than it sounds. I came back to Berlin. By 1946, two parties had begun to take form. One party very much wanted to get along with the Russians. They, I think I should say we, because I belong to that party, saw very little hope for the future of the world unless there was peace between the two powers. And there were certain things to encourage us. When we met socially with the Russians, we saw how passionate was their desire for peace. And some of our senior military people were similarly moved. They had had experience of war, and they'd had enough of it. But there was a second party. We met almost every evening for discussion in the big villas of the Nazis and the former German rich. The bombs had taken the houses of the poor. Now the Allied occupation took those of the affluent. This second group regarded our hopes as ridiculously soft-headed. Some were only showing how tough-minded they could be. But some spoke out of a knowledge of Stalin, a genuine concern for his intentions. Eastern Europe was gone. Surely Soviet ambitions extended to Western Europe, a far greater prize. Some were conservatives who had heard of Marx, world revolution, and the revolution could now be seen just across the lake in East Berlin. Present, too, were the pathologically belligerent, who, like the poor, are always with us. Some had found the war an exciting thing, and better another than going back to Indianapolis. Present, too, unless one is gifted in evading the obvious, was economic interest. The war had provided jobs, started and expanded the factories, better military tension, and back to the Great Depression. No one, or anyhow, not many, openly argued that the economic gains of the war should be preserved by the invention of a new menace. Economic interest always wears the disguise of national interest. It always has the solid respectability of practical business achievement. So it was then, and so it still is. One had an uneasy feeling that the respectable view would eventually triumph. And so it did. It had excellent help from the Soviets. In 1948, land and water communications with Berlin were interrupted. The barriers came down. Time has changed the view of this event. Few people think that the Soviets wanted to risk conflict, armed conflict in 1948. They were engaged in acts of harassment, not seeking the final showdown. If a convoy had presented itself firmly at the barrier, as many advocated at the time, it would probably have been let peacefully through. But we had airplanes, as often before and often since. Policy was made by that fact. We have the planes, let's show what they can do. And it is not easy to criticize men who wished at whatever cost to minimize the risk of armed conflict. I do not do so. And so came the airlift. By the spring of 1949, 8,000 tons of freight was being landed each day in Berlin. This was enough for survival. Berlin was not the only point of confrontation. A chain of events in those years was admirably designed to prove the inevitability of conflict, the march of world communism. The newsreels of the time recall the feeling. The Czech takeover of 1948, the Chinese revolution completed in 1949, and the Korean War, 1950. Report from red-dominated Prague, February 21st, and the beginning of the four fatal days that ended freedom in Czechoslovakia. Leaving their factories, Czech Communist Party members marched to the town hall square. The situation is tense. Twelve non-communist members of the National Cabinet have handed in their resignations, protesting the new consolidation of all police power into communist hands. In these films, just released through the new censorship of Czechoslovakia, Communist Premier Clement Gottwald denounces the ministers who have resigned as agents of foreign reaction. Again, in retrospect, our view of these events has changed. Each had its separate logic and no grand strategy was involved. Earlier Soviet steps in Eastern Europe, the Balkans, had not been resisted, and some had been effectively sanctioned in wartime discussions, notably those of Churchill with Stalin. The Chinese we no longer see as Moscow puppets, instruments of a grand strategy masterminded from the Kremlin. The very idea sounds odd, but it didn't seem odd back then. On 
another retreat for China's nationalist soldiers. Government troops pull out of the communist-threatened areas of Shanghai and Nanking, headed further south. Among those who have left Nanking is the generalissimo himself, Chiang Kai-shek, whose fading fortunes parallel those of his falling regime. That the North Koreans invaded South Korea, despite some revisionist history, is not in doubt. That it was part of the grand strategy of Soviet expansion is now very much in doubt. It, too, was probably an act of local initiative. None of this was then seen. Together, this march of events was devastating, and those who did not accept the inevitability of Soviet expansion cannot easily blame those who did. Then in 1949, the first Soviet A-bomb was exploded well before schedule. Surely the work of spies, it was thought. To the other tension was now added the transcendent fear of nuclear destruction. And so the confrontation, in all its rigidity, it was a perilous moment in history. And there's a sobering thought here, how much of the knowledge on which we then base decision has been since revised or eroded. Those who questioned were now no longer defeated in argument, and some were suppressed. Search for the more articulate became an industry. The symbol of the search was Senator Joe McCarthy. McCarthy, however, was an aberration soon to be struck down by alcohol and his curious inability to distinguish friends from his enemies. He owed much of his place in history to the need that many felt to deny their own past hopes, a rather hard thing to do. The true voice of the times was John Foster Dulles, law, religion, corporation lawyer, Wall Street, all the classical requisites for opposition to communism. Above all, it was John Foster Dulles who articulated the faith on which the conflict with the Soviets would be based. And it was richly in keeping with his own origins. Dulles grew up here in Watertown on Lake Ontario in northernmost New York State. His father was the Presbyterian minister in the town. And the countryside was only a step away. As a boy, he sailed on these waters with Alan Welch Dulles, his brother, partner-in-law, and in the Cold War battles to come. John Foster Dulles's case for the inevitable conflict avoided economics, no deeply suspect defense of capitalism, and no defense of democracy. We might have dictators on our side. His was a crusade for moral values, for right against wrong, good against bad, religion against no religion, the faith of the average neighborly God-fearing American. It was, let us note, a faith that required our policy to be either strictly moral or very cynical, and this was to be a problem in years to come. Dulles himself wandered from his small town origins. He went to Princeton and was intended for the ministry. But soon he was persuaded that he could secure his faith almost as adequately as a lawyer. By the age of 38, he was the senior partner of Sullivan and Cromwell, perhaps the most prestigious of the great Wall Street law firms. Wall Street was not exactly small-town America, and people do not think of corporation lawyers as being primarily concerned with God's work. They're thought to have more remunerative clients. Dulles, in 1929, was even a director of Shenandoah and Blue Ridge, the classic Goldman Sachs promotions that dissolved into very thin air when the stock market crashed. More wandering from his origins. Thomas E. Dewey, who launched Dulles in politics, said later that Dulles even took a temporary leave of absence from religion in these years, was an atheist, a very far cry from the boyhood days. However, almost everything having to do with John Foster Dulles is a trifle ambiguous. Almost all historians, friendly or otherwise, refer to his brilliant mind. Harold McMillan, on the other hand, who saw much of Dulles, was reminded of a statesman of whom it was said that his speech was slow, but it easily kept pace with his thought. Most people thought Dulles was paranoid where communism was concerned, but some said he got along well with the Russians. He was very much what they expected a capitalist to be like. In the Suez Crisis of 1955, he lined up with the Soviets against the British and the French and the Israelis. What is certain is that Dulles had what we may call the instinct for command. This is something that's very important. There's a type of person who, out of the very certainty of his purpose, right or wrong, assumes leadership and is conceded leadership. Douglas MacArthur was such a man. So was Charles de Gaulle. So we have seen was Lenin. There's an old Scottish saying that celebrates this kind of individual where McCrimmon sits is the head of the table. For exercising power, this instinct to command is a far, far more important thing than brilliance of mind or eloquence of speech or charm of manner. After World War II, Dulles revived his interest in religion and became active in the National Council of Churches. He had been at the Versailles Conference as a young aide, and now he also concerned himself again with foreign policy. He helped negotiate the Japanese peace treaty, and in 1953, Eisenhower made him Secretary of State. Not only was he now in office, so was his moral sanction of the Cold War, the inevitable conflict. John Foster Dulles was not a popular figure with liberals of my generation. 
Some of us agree with Reinhold Niebuhr, the noted theologian, who once said, Mr. Dulles's moral universe makes everything quite clear, too clear. Self-righteousness is the inevitable fruit of simple moral judgments. Holding and remembering, as I do, these attitudes, I think it well to let Mr. Dulles speak for himself. This he did at this, his father's church, on October 11th, 1953. terrible things that are happening in some parts of the world are due to the fact that political and social practices have been separated from spiritual content. That separation is almost total in the Soviet communist world. There the rulers hold a materialistic creed which denies the existence of moral law. It denies that men are spiritual beings. It denies that there are any such things as eternal verities. Any nation which bases its institutions on Christian principles cannot but be a dynamic nation. war was more than a moral and religious crusade. So long as it remained cold, avoided brute force, it came very close to being a Christian crusade. There was even that hint that it had the personal endorsement of Jesus. There was a further and much greater consequence. The moral case of Christians east of the Iron Curtain could not be inferior to that of their co-religionists in the West. They were as entitled to rescue as those of the West were to defense. The Dulles case for the Cold War therefore became a case for liberation, for rolling back the Iron Curtain. You will see the basic problem that I stress. If immorality was the faith of Soviet policy, morality had to be the test of ours. We would have to live up to our own precepts. But this we couldn't do, and perhaps no country could. The Dulles policy, therefore, had within it the seeds of its own contradiction and defeat. But this was in the future. For the moment, after Czechoslovakia, after China, after Korea, though Eisenhower had brought that war to an end, there was no opposition. The world was set for a further perilous passage, not yet completed. I was co-chairman with Dean Acheson in the latter 50s of one of the minor intellectual organs of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Advisory Council. Acheson was chairman for foreign policy, and I was chairman for domestic policy. At our meetings, Atchison attacked Dulles, lucidly, brilliantly, and with a kind of resourceful invective, for being too soft on the Soviets. And the drafting of our foreign policy resolutions consisted, I sometimes thought almost exclusively, of toning down, often only a very little, Atchison's virtual declarations of war. That was the nature of the political opposition in those days. At the more practical level, the Pentagon developed weapon systems that were often duplicating, sometimes competitive, and which were routinely approved. The word Pentagon itself became a synonym for military bureaucracy and military influence. And a large and growing industry responded to its needs. We see now the beginning of the movement from the faith to the competitive trap. One of the great military developments of the time, of all time. Polaris tells the story. In the 1950s, the Navy faced the fate of the man bomber. Surface ships, including aircraft carriers, were vulnerable to homing missiles. They might still be justified, but they were no longer a decisive weapon. And the solution was Polaris. Polaris was born here at Woods Hole on Cape Cod in 1956. People could assemble here for a summer in seeming innocence. The project was codenamed Nobska, after the lighthouse. Eminent scientists assembled. Edward Keller. Columbus Isselin of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He brought a profound knowledge of the ocean depths. And Robert Oppenheimer was not asked. His commitment to weapons development was in doubt. He questioned the wisdom of developing the H-bomb, so his security clearance had been lifted. Present also were people from MIT and the academic establishment, and the weapons manufacturers, IBM, the Navy, the chiefs of staff. A symbiosis of the armed services, industry, the scientists, and the engineers. The problem to be solved here and around the Whitney House, how to devise a means of firing nuclear missiles from a submarine under water. It succeeded. It is now believed that Polaris was an answer to a Soviet threat that had not yet developed. It then produced the response with which it had been intended to deal. But this is a trivial detail in the larger game. In that game, we do what encourages the Soviet response, and they do what encourages our response. 
There had been a failure of intelligence on Soviet achievement, but initiation on either side does not wait on accurate intelligence on what the other side is doing. Good intelligence only stimulates the response. Our intelligence operation, the CIA, was now under Alan Dulles. He is not remembered for his capacity to avoid error. We do not know, I should say I do not know, the exact conjunction of interests that produces the Soviet initiative and response. But we do know that bureaucracies, great organizations, are much the same the world around. It is fair to assume since Stalin's day, perhaps before, that the Soviet organizations that develop and make weapons see their bureaucratic prestige, position, and opportunity in the weapons that they can design and create for the Soviet armed forces. And that the Soviet armed forces see the constant development and increase of these weapons as the source of their bureaucratic power, prestige, and position. I've long felt there was a convergent tendency in great bureaucratic operations, east and west, and I believe it operates here. As the 50s proceeded, so did this race, each side supporting the other, and with very few questions asked. One of the first questions came from a surprising source, Nikita Khrushchev. He would shortly be supported by another very strong voice, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The perception of Khrushchev was very different and very plausible. The bureaucrats, Malenkov, Molotov, Zhukov, had taken over after Stalin, Oganin, Khrushchev. Khrushchev was only one. Faithful surely to the old master, bureaucrats do not change things. Khrushchev traveled, visited the United States, spoke of the dangers of conflict in the nuclear age. The defenders of the notion of irrepressible conflict were not reassured. An infinitely tricky man, this Khrushchev, or a clever peasant. He had promised to bury capitalism, that surely meant the bomb, and there could be no reconciliation with the man who took off his shoes at the UN and banged them in public. The play was still with the defenders of the faith, military, and civilian. In fact, as the 50s became the 60s, the perception of the conflict was changing, in the West and evidently in the Soviet Union, too. In 1959, Khrushchev met with Dwight D. Eisenhower at Camp David. Khrushchev later called it the president's dacha. In private, if Khrushchev's memoirs are to be trusted, and neither the Soviets nor the CIA could possibly hire anyone with such a good imagination, the two heads of state exchanged thoughts on the way each was subject to the pressure for new weapons, each in response to the warnings of their generals as to what the other country was doing. Each resisted, as each said, and each eventually gave in. Khrushchev continued to speak for peace. As a result of the useful talks we had with President Eisenhower, uh, we came uh, to uh, an agreement that all outstanding international issues should be... And now as Dwight D. Eisenhower left office, came his powerful warning, the most influential speech of his career. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. What was it that awakened us to the dangers of this fatal rivalry? A rivalry propelled by forces within and between the two countries. On the decisive forces, everyone must be allowed to make his own selection. My number five, they were Khrushchev, Cuba, the Vietnam War, the growing divisions within the communist world, and the persistent unwillingness of the human mind to accept persuasion that is in conflict with evidence. All who exercise power find this latter obstinacy by far the most annoying tendency with which they have to contend. To see the forces for change, we must go back to the early 1960s. Cuba is the kind of small country that history is intended to forget. It now became very, very large in this time. First in 1960, the Bay of Pigs. Not had developed since Joshua's trumpets were turned on Jericho had there been a military operation in which there was so little rational expectation of success. The Bay of Pigs was at first defended by false denials of American involvement that the American people were expected to believe. This was a highly advertised rejection of the specific moral standard on which Dulles had based the war against communism. Then in 1962, Cuba again, the missile crisis. For a few tense and terrible days, people looked directly into the pit. There can be no doubt as to the result. Thousands and perhaps millions of people became open to the idea of an alternative to conflict. There were many speeches before on its inevitability. The generals were especially eloquent. There have been very few such speeches since. 
In 1964, Khrushchev disappeared from the scene, he became a non-person. It was agricultural failure, not his foreign policy, that one is told, bit him in. I think he deserves more in memory from his countrymen than he receives. Bureaucratic power, we can assume, was further strengthened. By now, there was a new denial of Dulles. Another proof that the conflict with communism was not a moral crusade. That, too, concerned a country that history was meant to forget, Vietnam. Vietnam, its government, were a very, very poor advertisement for morality. And the result was something new in modern history. War, invariably, has ended all discussion, all dissent. This war encouraged it, and especially among the idealistic young, who would also have to fight. The objection came to a head in 1968 at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. I did not myself think that this was a time for neutrality. Those 10 days in Chicago, before and during the 1968 convention, were, I think, the most interesting of my life. We had no hope of nominating a candidate, but we could stand firm against any compromise that might endorse or excuse the war. The peace forces would then leave Chicago, far too large a group to be ignored. Our ranks held, and the voice for peace for once was more confident than that for war. The war was gradually wound down, eventually brought to an end. The old faith, meanwhile, had suffered another blow. China and the Soviet Union had fallen out. We're going their separate and now opposing ways. No longer a monolithic communism to oppose. Richard Nixon, let all give him credit, saw the opportunity, went to Peking, went to Moscow, and was welcomed in both capitals. The faith was gone. Was it ludicrous to hope that the terrible competition was now at an end? It was too optimistic. Though the motivating faith was now gone, the competitive trap by which each power contributes to the military expenditure of the other remained. Now a kind of naked competition, a naked symbiosis, and this is still with us. It's a solid, tangible thing. To see it, one journeys out to Tucson, Arizona, and then just out of town to the Davies Montan Air Force Base. So, this is it. The armed services want to exist, and to exist they must have weapons. And the weapons firms want to exist, make money. To do this, they must produce weapons, and the Soviets provide the justification, and we justify the same process in the Soviet Union. It is no longer believed that conflict between the two powers is necessary or inevitable. No one believes that either system could survive the conflict. We are reduced to believing that the competition prevents the conflict. Here is one result of the competition, the world's largest used airplane lot. Everyone by now must remember, recognize the B-52, the latest military classic. The ethical position of the competitive weapons culture needs to be carefully understood. On our side in recent years, there has occasionally been open bribery. In 1975, the Lockheed Corporation was found to have distributed some $25 million to promote purchases of its products. The indignation was very great. And in Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Germany, the effect on friendly governments and politicians could easily have led a paranoid anti-communist to imagine that the corporation had been taken over in its financially troubled days by some financially astute arm of the Soviet Secret Service. The need was to ensure orders and a continuing unbroken assembly line, and not only by Lockheed. There are also more sophisticated manifestations where no money changes hands. That would be considered too crude, even obscene. In this world, influence is mostly a friendly, civilized thing which breaks no law. We should never be diverted by the search for corruption, even for gentlemanly misbehavior. Mostly the competition unites the efforts of honest men, men caught in the trap by economics, bureaucratic interest, the pressures to keep production going, international circumstances larger than they. And it goes on and on and on. Rather like these helicopters. They're not, by the way, obsolete. They were, as it is said, made surplus to requirements by peace in Vietnam. There is agreement, even in high military circles, that the naked weapons competition simply cannot go on. There remains the hard question of what will take its place. What of the spending it ensures? The jobs it provides? 
John Maynard Keynes, during the years of the Great Depression, once proposed that the British government should put bundles of pound notes into disused coal pits and then fill them up. Much employment would be then created by men digging the notes up, and much demand would be generated by the spending of the notes. This idea was uh, never taken up. But instead, in the post-Keynesian world, weapons expenditures, the cycle of design, production, obsolescence, replacement, has served pretty much the same purpose instead. I once called this military Keynesianism. Military spending is certainly more easily increased than spending for civilian needs and welfare. Like those lines of helicopters, the limits are infinity. But I no longer think military spending is irreplaceable as a support for the modern economy. The civilian needs of a highly urbanized society, the great cities in particular, are also infinitely extensible, as we shall see later in these programs. The Deutsche Demokratische Republik. Somewhere in the USSR, there is also a Davies Montana. It's not an easy place to go and photograph. As always, we see behavior and anomaly most plainly in the open society. But as the competition here examined is two-sided, so are its costs. And as in the West, they're not confined to principles. This is the May Day Parade in East Berlin. As in the Soviet Union, the weapons competition here too uses energies, resources, that are subtracted from urgent civilian need. A need even more urgent than ours. But the ultimate problem is not the cost, but the threat. The threat of mass reciprocal destruction. This threat comes to its ultimate focus here in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. NORAD is the command post for nuclear war, built one mile into the heart of the Rocky Mountains. It's a long way in. The doors are steel, two feet thick. It is hoped that they're also bombproof. this fortress yet more resistant to nuclear bombs, a few weeks more resistant than the people outside, each underground unit of the headquarters is sprung separately. The springs absorb the shock, leave the rooms functional. There are underground reservoirs for water. In case of attack, NORAD is self-sufficient for 30 days. This is the central control room. Here the news of impending attack if all works properly, will first be known. The responding decision is, of course, for higher authority, if he can be reached. A minor epilogue on the Cold War. Both Soviet and Chinese sites are now monitored from NORAD. This is a reminder that the day of a simple, unified, relentlessly probing enemy is past. It's a reminder also that to arrest and roll back the competition between the Soviets and ourselves is also an essential step for halting the spread, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Unless that is done, the watch here at NORAD will one day become very complex. There will be no time for the children. There will be no children. The history of the arms competition we see is the history of the most formidable interaction of ideas and interests. Nationalism, patriotism, religious faith, rival economic systems, industrial and bureaucratic interest. All and more are causes. And all of them come to their ultimate point of focus here in the Pentagon. Here in the Gold Room, where the Joint Chiefs of Staff meet to make final military decisions and recommendations. I once came to this room in 1962 after the Chinese and the Indians had clashed in the high Himalayas. It was to lecture the chiefs on the military and political issues in that distant war. I don't know if they were impressed, but I can tell you I certainly was. What can we sort out from the conflicting forces that converge on this room? 
What is the current truth on this deadly competition? Where lies the responsibility for it now? And where lies the responsibility for bringing it to an end? We no longer believe, I don't think people generally believe, as did Dulles, that a deep moral issue is involved. There was once, I have no doubt, an economic imperative. In the years following World War II, the United States economy was sustained by a kind of military Keynesianism. But in more recent times, Germany and Japan have shown that the modern capitalist economy can function and can function very well without this military support. These countries have used their resources for new, efficient civilian plant and equipment. We have used much more of ours for weapons. And this was their advantage in world trade competition. The competition between ourselves and the Soviets is increasingly narrow, increasingly simple. It is bureaucratic and technological. <clears throat> Each country has great organizations, military and civilian, that are sustained by what the other does. What of the responsibility for arresting the competition? We shouldn't spend too much time looking for scapegoats or villains, either in the military or in the supporting industrial firms. We should understand their function, their viewpoint, their bureaucratic and economic interests, and the perils to which they subject us and to which they subject themselves. But to bring the competition to an end, we must look to the civilian leadership. The responsibility must be squarely, unequivocally there. It is a political task, and in this game, civilian political leaders are the only anti-heroes and the only potential heroes. The United States can't bring this competition to an end by itself. But neither can we use the fact that we are in competition with the Soviets as an excuse for continuing the competition something that we have frequently done in the past. We know that the Russians, far more than we, have had experience of the devastation of war.